Good evening and welcome to the WDSU News Hot Seat. I'm Travers Mackle. Tonight we are talking about the unthinkable tragedy that happened last week in Uvalde, Texas. More than 20 people, including 19 students, shot and killed by a lone gunman in that school. We're going to dive deeper into the conversation here about gun control, mental health, and the security aspect at schools. Joining us right now, State Representative Royce Duplessis, who represents New Orleans, security expert, former SWAT team commander with the NOPD, Mike Kahn, and Dr. Mio Mint from Tulane University and Children's Hospital. Thank you all for joining us about this very sensitive but very important topic to discuss here. Thanks, Trevor. Mike, let's start with you. We've seen some flaws in the security here. It turns out a lot of things that came out initially about a resource officer being on campus confronting the gunman turned out not to be true. Also, the time that he was in the building, I know you have a lot on this topic right now. If you could just give us an update about what went right and what went wrong, because we're learning a lot about what really happened on that day in Uvalde, Texas. So what we know, Travers, is that there was a, a vehicle crash around 1130 in the morning. Um, the individual shot at a couple of people outside at apparently a cemetery across the street. The police did not arrive until around 1144 on this situation. The protocol for any active shooter that's gone nationally for the past 20 years is as soon as you get, it used to be your first four or five officers on the scene. Now it's your first two to three officers on the scene. As soon as they get on the scene, they go in together and they continue to go in until they find the threat and neutralize it as long as the shooting is going on. That means they pass walking wounded. They pass other people. The walking wounded can give you some information like telling you where the shooter is, what the shooter looked like or anything like that. You could apply a tourniquet, but you keep on going until the shooter is neutralized. And this happens immediately when you get on scene. That unfortunately didn't happen here. If if different protocols were in place, could lives look, everybody hates to armchair quarterback this, but could lives possibly have been saved here if, if things were done differently? Absolutely, Travers, and I hate to put it like this, but we now know that he was in four classrooms instead of just one, and that's why it is so important to get in as soon as possible. That's why the first officers, and it's not a safe situation or a safe job. You're going into a place where there is shooting going on, but that is your job to go towards the shooting, not run away or not hold the scene and make it a SWAT roll. They should have immediately gone in that building and not stopped until the shooter was neutralized. Mike, we're going to have more with you and also Representative Duplessis. Hang tight. Let's talk to Dr. Mint about this. You deal with the mental health of kids and trauma involving children. The kids that survived were seeing these stories play out, and they've described in graphic detail what they saw. How do kids and their parents, the survivors, start to process and come to grips with what we saw in Uvalde? And as you mentioned, the, the process definitely starts as soon as you know, it had to occur. And one of the things that we want the grownups to know is making sure that they are actually, you know, well supported themselves as well, because the kid's gonna be looking to the parents and caregivers for the support. So making sure that grownups are supporting one another themselves. And for the kids, really giving them time and allow them to uh, process at their own pace, making sure that adults are actually creating time and space for them to ask questions and providing the uh, appropriate answers based on their age and not overwhelm them with additional information that they may not need or want. Let me ask you this. The four of us are all from New Orleans. It's a close-knit community. There's probably six degrees of separation before the four of us on this Zoom video right here. Uvalde is a small community. Everybody knows everybody. How did they handle something like this, given the fact that probably every single person in that small Texas town is touched by this tragedy? Yes, and, and the, in some way, the, having that community together and going through this may be helpful, but asking for additional um, support from the larger communities and leaning onto other that may be a little bit more removed from it can be extremely helpful. Obviously, the professionals helps, uh, can be incredibly powerful. For New Orleans here, as you mentioned, you know, our children's hospital has a, a trauma and grief center uh, led by Dr. Julie Kaplow that can be helpful for a lot of youth who are experiencing gun violence in our city as well. That's good to know. Before we wrap up in a little bit, we're gonna come back to you with some more tips. 
Let's jump to you, Representative DuPlessis. Obviously, gun control legislation, it's always a big topic in Louisiana. The spotlight is on it once again for all the wrong reasons because of what happened in Buffalo two weeks ago and then just days ago in the city of Uvalde, Texas. Before we get to you, let's play a soundbite from one of your colleagues, Danny McCormick, who's putting a piece of legislation through, same piece of legislation as last year that the governor vetoed. It deals with easing restrictions on concealed carry. A lot of law enforcement is against this. Let's listen to what he has to say. If you can legally open carry, you'll be able to legally, uh, legally conceal carry if this bill goes into law. All right, Representative Duplessis, you know where Representative McCormick stands on this. Also, other members of the body, what are your thoughts about, about gun control legislation and this bill that's making its way through the Senate right now? Well, my, my hope, first and foremost, is that the governor vetoes this legislation just like he did last year because this bill has no business becoming law. But I think what it is is reflective of uh, how backwards we are when it comes to this conversation and our policies with respect to gun laws here in Louisiana and throughout the country. Uh, it's very clear because the evidence and the data shows that states who have weaker gun laws, there's a direct correlation between increased gun violence. So the weaker that our gun laws are, the, like, the, the more likelihood there will be for increases in gun violence. Look, at the end of the day, this is uh, a perverted interpretation of the Second Amendment. The framers of the Constitution never envisioned that an 18 year old could walk into a gun store and purchase a semi-automatic assault rifle that has one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to cause extreme destruction and that's to kill. But the reason these bills are passing so easily in states is because too many politicians are more concerned with their NRA scoring and getting a 100% scoring record from NRA and being controlled by the gun lobby than as opposed to really caring about life. And the real interesting thing about uh, the representative who you just cited, as you mentioned, we've been in the news for a lot of the wrong reasons. He just recently had a bill that would have criminalized women for making personal choices about their own health care because he claims to be pro-life. You can't be pro-life when you're for the proliferation of semi-automatic assault rifles, when you're for people being able to walk around with concealed carry with no licenses or no permits. Uh, it doesn't make us safer. It makes us less safe. And it's completely absurd. Let me just hyper-focus in on New Orleans here, too. I and mean, I have you on, we on this, too, as well, as well, Mike. There were some bills designed to give New Orleans, I guess, more leeway when it comes to gun laws in this city and cracking down on gun crimes. Because obviously, look, New Orleans is different than the rest of the state. I think Representative Mandy Landry copied that legislation from New York City. As we know, New York City is a lot different than the rest of that state. The DA and police, Mike, you're a former cop, went and testified on behalf of this legislation, and it basically went down in flames. Why is it so hard to get Gun laws changed. Is it because of what you just said? The gun lobby is so strong in this state. Yeah, absolutely. I, look, I, I co-authored that legislation because I believe in it. New Orleans is clearly a very unique city in comparison to the rest of the state. We're not like rural Louisiana. We're not like northern Louisiana. We have very unique challenges, especially when it comes to gun violence in the state. So why shouldn't we have the ability to enact policies that are more tailored to the challenges that we face as a city. But as you pointed out, the bill didn't even make it out of committee. And I think it goes right back to the fact that too many politicians are bought and sold by the NRA and they really don't care about life. They just they really care about their um, their record with the NRA. And look, Mike, if you can weigh in on this, look, cops, I know, like I said, the police, the, one of the superintendents, not Sean Ferguson, but one of his uh, top ranking officials went and, and testified on behalf of that bill. Are things different in the city of New Orleans? I know we're talking about Uvalde, Texas, but when it just comes to gun gun crimes and gun laws in the city of New Orleans, should New Orleans be different than the rest of the state from a police standpoint? From a police standpoint, the department doesn't want every individual who goes and buys a gun to be able to carry it without the proper training and or permit. Uh, there needs to be some sort of criteria in those things going on. Uh, there is an evolving factor where people believe they have their rights and they believe that right now with police departments being short on manpower and other things that they need to protect themselves in certain wish situations and have the ability to do so. Now, there is a way to do that in the proper format. Dr. Mint, we're going to wrap up with you here because I think a lot of people watching this right now, even in New Orleans, it, it struck a chord with them. Look, the three of us, I know Dr. Mint, Mike, Royce and myself are all parents, and you probably went home and hugged your, your kids a little bit harder that night. 
what are some resources for parents here locally that may be struggling watching something like this happen in Texas? Yeah, um, the children's hospitals um, and trauma and grief centers are like put together the resources um, that are available, and I'm happy to share that with you. The um, for the grown ups, um, those who are living in Orleans Parish, reaching out to Metropolitan Human Service Districts um, or other um, mental health support uh, clinicians may be really helpful. It may be because we also have a shortage of mental health clinicians, and that's another crisis that is occurring parallel to all of the trauma and needs. Um, reaching out to your primary care clinicians uh, might be the first steps to actually get that support. So talk to the pediatricians for your children and talk to your own clinicians uh, for your own well-being. All right. Dr. Mio, man, we appreciate your time. Mike Kahn, security expert, state representative, Royce Duplessis. I wish we had more time because this is a topic that needs a lot of attention that we could spend more time on. Unfortunately, though, we are out of time. We appreciate all of your insight, gentlemen. You can see this entire segment starting Monday morning on our website, WDSU.com.